Today on Answers with Bayless Conley. Everyone, everyone worships something. Everyone is a worshiper. It is in us to worship. All right, you want to stop the advance of the wicked one? Worship. It's the, it brings the ordained strength of God on the scene. There are many questions you are faced with every day. We are all searching for answers that will make a real difference in our lives. It's hard to imagine that these answers might be right in front of us. Get ready to discover answers in the Bible with Bayless Conley. Hello, friend. Have you ever had the desire to have a better prayer life, to have a more fruitful prayer life, to have a more real prayer life? We're going to be talking in very simple terms today about how to pray. I'm going to give you some extremely simple steps that you can put into practice that will help you have a fruitful prayer life. I use these steps myself, and I think they'll be a great blessing to you. And now here's Bayless with an inspirational thought you can apply today. Well, I want to use the word pray, says a simple acronym tonight, P-R-A-Y. We're going to talk about four things, praise, repentance, asking, and yielding. And prayer in its simplest definition is just communicating with God. If you have a Bible, look with me at Psalm 100. And that should start, I think, the best way to always come to God is to begin with praise. When we start our time to pray, even if you have pressing issues, it will be worth your while to spend some time thanking God, worshiping God to start with. Psalm 100 in verse 1, it says, Make a joyful shout to the Lord, all you lands. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come before his presence with singing. Know that the Lord, he is God. It is he who has made us and not we ourselves. We are his people and the sheep of his pasture. Enter into his gates with thanksgiving and into his courts with praise. Be thankful to him and bless his name. Our talks about shouting and singing and entering his courts with praise, entering his gates with thanksgiving. And I, I like the Message Bible. It says, you know, enter with the password, thank you. You know, in some of the offices, different places in this building and other buildings, there's a keypad outside of some of the office areas. And, and frankly, until the other day, I never knew the code. Um, I have a little key. I actually got one on me now, and I just swipe my key, and it opens up. But I'm walking over to open it. My six-year-old grandson runs up and says, I'll open it for you, Papa. I thought, how are you going to open it? Boo, boo, boo. He puts in the code and opens the door. He knew the password, and I didn't even know the password. I had asked my six-year-old grandson what the password was. He goes, Papa, that's so easy. I said, where did you learn? He said, I just watched somebody. <laughs> But you know, the, the password to enter into God's presence is thank you. And there's a lot of things all of us can thank God for if we think about it. I think we should take time, as the old saying goes, to count our blessings. I mean, the fact that you're here tonight in your right mind, some of you it might be debatable, but most of you here are in your right mind, you can, can thank God for that. You know, even in the Lord's Prayer, as we call it, when Jesus taught his disciples to pray in Matthew 6, he said, 6, after this matter, therefore pray, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed, holy be your name. He started it with a note of, of worship. He started it with a note of praise. Number one, we worship God. We should worship God because he is the only being that is worthy of our worship. He has made us and not we ourselves. He is our God. Psalm 18 verse three says, I will call upon the Lord who is worthy 
to be praised. Revelation 4.11, you are worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power. For you created all things, and by your will they exist and were created. He alone is worthy of worship. Which brings me to the second reason we should start with worship and why it's so important. It's because all of us were created as worshipers. It is a part of our DNA. Every human being is a worshiper. It's in every person. In one way or another, everyone worships. Saint and sinner alike, everyone is a worshiper. Everyone, everyone worships something. Everyone is a worshiper. It is in us to worship. But there's only one being in existence that is worthy of our worship, and that is our God. And thirdly, it's important to worship because it honors God, but there's also some side benefits to us. These are not the main reasons we worship, but these things happen. When we worship, it brings and it stops. Can you say those two things? It brings and it stops. Number one, when we worship, it brings God's presence. In Isaiah 64 and 5, speaking of God, it says, you meet him who rejoices. In Psalm 22 and verse 3, it says, God inhabits the praises of Israel, the praises of his people. Literally, God is enthroned upon the singing praises of his people. The authority and the majesty and the presence of God comes and fills up that atmosphere in which we praise. The book of James uses this principle. It says, draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. The best way I know to draw near to God is through worship and through praise. And friend, when God's presence comes, there's liberty. 2 Corinthians 3.17 says, where the spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. I was thinking today about a friend that had called me years back on the phone, and he called in an absolute panic, who had gotten himself into a pickle. He'd made some wrong decisions, and now he was having to eat the bitter fruit of the choices he made, and he was absolutely at the end of himself when he called. I'd never heard this guy. He's usually cool and collected, absolutely panicking. Bayless, what do I do? What do I do? You know, th this is what happened, and... and I'm responsible, but what do I do? I didn't know what to tell him to do, except one thing. I said, bro, the only thing I know to tell you to do is right now you need to worship God. You need to walk back and forth in your kitchen, lift your arms, you need to shout, and you need to sing praises to God, and you need to begin thanking God vocally out loud. He said, okay, and I'm sure when he started to do it, he probably felt like there was a 50-pound demon sitting on top of his head, but he did it anyway. And I talked to him the next day. He said, as, I, he said, as soon as I hung up the phone, Bayless, I started to praise God. I just started walking back and forth with my hands up, speaking the name of Jesus and, and worshiping God. He said, and that confusion lifted off of me, and the peace of God came. He says, and God showed me what to do. It brings God's presence. And secondly, it stops. It stops the work of the enemy. We're here in the book of Psalms. Look at Psalm 8 with me. When we praise God, it brings God's presence and it stops the work of the enemy. Psalm 8 and verse 2. It says, Out of the mouth of babes and nursing infants... You have ordained strength. Everyone say ordained strength. You have ordained strength because of your enemies, that you may silence the enemy and the avenger. Right? Out of the mouth of babes, you've ordained strength because of your enemies, that you may silence the enemy and the avenger. Do you know, Jesus quoted this verse from Psalm 8. The children were worshiping Jesus out loud, vocally. 
The religious leaders of his day became very upset. You hear what these kids are doing? And Jesus quoted Psalm 8 and 2. But he didn't just quote it. He interpreted it. Being the living word, Jesus can interpret the written word. Look with me at Matthew 21, if you would. Matthew's gospel, chapter 21, where this took place. Matthew 21 and verse 15. But when the chief priests and scribes saw the wonderful things that he did and the children crying out in the temple saying, Hosanna to the son of David, they were indignant and said to him, do you hear what these are saying? And Jesus said to them, yes. Have you never read out of the mouth of babes and nursing infants you have perfected praise? Now Jesus interpreted ordained strength as perfect, perfected praise. Ronald Knox translation just says vocal praise. Listen, according to Jesus, praise is the ordained strength of God. Praise is the ordained strength of God. Why? Because of your enemies, that you might silence the enemy and the avenger. That word silence in the Hebrew doesn't just mean to make quiet. It includes that but it means to cause to cease from all activity. So he says, well, the devil's attacking me. It's like this going wrong and that's going wrong. And every time I turn around, this is happening. And for no reason, this person attacked me at work and I got this going wrong. All right, you want to stop the advance of the wicked one? Worship. It's the, it brings the ordained strength of God on the scene and it causes the enemy to stop his activity, causes him to cease and to be still. It brings the presence of God. It stops the work of the enemy. There was a gal in church, her name was Kathy. She used to um, actually run sound for us as well as a number of other things and one day I noticed Kathy just looked really, really pale. So Janet and I went and talked to her. I said, look, Kathy, anything going on? You just, you look really, really pale. She said, well, Pastor, I just got back from the doctor and uh, had a whole battery of tests run. They did x-rays and they found a whole cluster of tumors inside of me. She said, I looked at the x-rays. It looked like a big bunch of grapes. He says, that's why I look this way. He said, I'm trusting God. I said, well, we're going to trust God with you. You know, you want to get somebody else to do the sound? She said, no, I'm going I'm to keep doing sound. And I remember it was a Sunday morning, a few days after we'd had that conversation with her and prayed with her. She's back doing the sound, and, and I didn't think a lot about it. And after service, I noticed, like, her color had changed, and she looked normal again. I didn't say anything. She had another doctor's appointment, went back, came back, said, Pastor, you know, the other day during worship time, I'm working the board, doing the sound. I had one hand lifted up. I was worshiping God. She said, suddenly, God's presence came upon me and my knees buckled for a moment. She says, I went back to the doctor yesterday. That entire cluster of tumors has disappeared. They had no explanation. I sat with the doctor and I looked at the x-rays side by side. One was completely clean. The other, there was a whole, you know, cluster of looked like grapes. So Jesus healed me and he did it while I was worshiping. I'm just telling you, friend, worship is never, ever wasted time. It's never wasted time. Now, I'm not much for, you know, this business about, you know, warfare worship and we're going to war again. Listen, God alone is the focus of our worship. You know, stopping the enemy, that's just a side benefit. I'm not even caring about him. I'm just putting my focus on God, who's my answer, who's my source, who's my maker. And as I worship him, his presence comes. I draw nigh to him, he draws nigh to me. He meets me when I rejoice. And when his presence comes, so does his ordained strength, and it stops the work of the enemy. So we enter with praise. Everyone say praise. praise. 
All right, R. Our second letter stands for repent. Now, repentance is just an inward change of heart resulting in an outward change of direction. Quote to you, I bet you've heard this. Second Chronicles 7 and 14. God says, if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and heal their land. That turning has to do with repentance. As we come to God, we may have needs. It's important to get our hearts clean first. It's important to do a little self-examination. You know, Psalm 66 and verse 18 says, if I regard iniquity in my heart, the Lord will not hear. So the second part of prayer, worship God for a little while and then invite the searchlight of God to illuminate your own heart. God, is there anything in my life that's, that's hindering your work? Is there anything that maybe I need to change? I remember one day I was in the car with Janet. I was mad at her. I don't even remember why, but I was mad. And so, uh, you know, me, she, wants, she gets mad. She wants to talk about things. It's much healthier than my way. Me, I go quiet. It's probably like most guys. I'm getting much better at that. And she's had to be patient with me while I've been growing. But, you know, I was doing one of those things. Man, I'm giving her the silent treatment. We're in the car. I'm just like, yeah, you don't even exist to me right now. <laughs> And I felt like the Holy Spirit whispered to me, says, Bayless, if you're out of fellowship with your wife, you are out of fellowship with me. I said, baby, I'm sorry. <laughs> but I think sometimes we don't even realize when we slip into an attitude that's displeasing to God. You know, the psalmist talked about presumptuous sins and secret faults. And, you know, I think we need to say, God, is, is, is there anything... Now, you don't want to belabor this point. You know, if you pray earnestly and there's nothing there, move on. Don't make a big deal out of it. Don't make something up. But if you do have this sense that something's not right, it's like you're washing your feet with your socks on or something, and it's like, God, what is it? And if he shows you repent or of something that you know that you're up to that's not right or not consistent with godly living or consistent with, a, you know, principles of scripture, repent, change. It's an important part of prayer. And then we come to the part that everyone likes. That's our third letter. A stands for ask. We're here in Matthew. Look at Matthew chapter 7. And I honestly don't think we should just rush to asking. I, I think it is important to worship and to make sure our hearts are clean first. And then, then we ask. Matthew 7 and verse Seven, Jesus said, ask. And you get it one out of five times. Ask, and if God is in a good mood, no, ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and it will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives. He who seeks finds. And to him who knocks, it will be opened. Or what man is there among you who if his son asks for bread, will he give him a stone? Or if he asks for a fish, will he give him a serpent? If you then being evil, speaking of in comparison with God, if you know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father who is in heaven give good things to those who ask him? Everyone say ask. Ask. You know, Jesus said in Matthew 21, 22, and whatever things you ask in prayer, believing, you will receive. We must be careful not to water down the words of Jesus to somehow bring our theology down to the level of our experience. Well, I, you know, I asked and it didn't happen. And so, you know, just he really didn't mean that and we need to qualify it. And Jesus meant what he said. I think sometimes we haven't taken care of some of these other issues. We frankly haven't used the password. We haven't even entered in. We're just in a, a hurry. We're not in a, a place where we've got a, you know, really clean heart. We got road dust on our heart just from daily living, that we, we need to take time to dust that off and get clean before God. And then we need to ask. You know, we, we had a 
guy in the church years ago that uh, we did a whole seminar on prayer for a week. And um, each night he would cover a, different, a couple of different types of prayer. And this one night, the first half, he was talking about praying for something just for yourself. You know, Jesus talked about, ask that you might receive that your joy may be full. I think that's John 16. He said, God's interested in you being happy. So right now, he said, we're going we're gonna to stop and we're going to pray. Just ask for something, you know, consistent with the godly lifestyle. You know, that, that it's not, not outlandish, but something that, that would bring you joy. Just a personal prayer to bring you joy. So everybody's praying. I'm standing in the front and I'm thinking for a minute, said, you know, I'd really, really like a little fishing boat. And so I prayed a prayer. I said, God, I would like a little fishing boat that has two swivel chairs in it so your back doesn't get sore from sitting all day long. Two swivel chairs, not real big, but something that I could trailer to some of the local lakes and fish in, and just big enough to pile the whole family. The kids were real small at the time. Something big enough to pile the whole family in. And so I prayed that prayer. No one on planet Earth knew what I prayed. No one. A few days later, my dad calls me. He says, I wanted to give you a, a ring. He says, I was just uh, reading in the paper today, and I saw this ad, this guy selling a boat, and I thought I might go over and check it out. You want to come? I go, sure. Now, you need to understand, this is true. Up to that point, it had probably been 40 years since my father had used the word boat in a sentence with me. He's not a boat guy. He doesn't like boats. He doesn't talk about boats. He never went on boats. Just like boats are not in his world at all. So it was just, I mean, it was bizarre. So we go over, there's this old guy. He's got this little beautiful aluminum boat on a trailer with two swivel chairs, little nine and a half horsepower motor on the back. He's selling it for a really, really good price. Trailer's in great shape. The boat is immaculate. And I lean over to my dad. I said, Dad, I want to buy this boat. He looks at me and says, you can't. I said, why? He says, I'm buying it and giving it to you. So within, you know, 72 hours of praying this prayer, very specific prayer, I've got this boat on a trailer in my driveway. And it actually did bring me a lot of joy. In fact, it brought some other guys in the church joy too. I loaned it to some guys for a long time and they, they, uh, they got a lot of mileage out of it. But you know, I, I realize that uh, in the grand scope of eternal things with priceless souls hanging in the balance and world events going on, you know, having a little boats, it's really a, a pretty nice luxury, and it's not that important in the scale of things, but, but I think it illustrates that our Father really is desiring to answer our prayers. How much more will your Heavenly Father give good things to those who ask Him? And let's not put God in a box as to how He answers. God does not fit well into anyone's box. In fact, he refuses to go into the boxes that we make. And then our final letter in pray is why that stands for yield. Just like you're driving, you see a yield sign. That means the other car has the right of way. That's where we give God the right of way. We yield, we get quiet, and we listen. This is where God gets what he wants. Prayer is a two-way street. It's not just us reading off a prayer list to our celestial Santa Claus. The most important part of prayer is listening to what he wants to say to us. Psalm 37 and verse 4 says, Delight yourself also in the Lord, and he shall give you the desires of your heart. That doesn't just mean be happy in God and you'll get whatever you want. Delight yourself also in the Lord, the phrase delight yourself is a translation of a Hebrew word that literally means 
to become soft or pliable. Become soft or pliable before the Lord and he will give you the desires of your heart. And the idea is when I assume this posture of yieldedness, that God, I'm not asking for anything right now. I just, I'm here. Shape me, mold me. Is there anything you want to say to me? And when we assume that yielded posture of suppleness before God, it says he'll give us the desires of our heart. Now, I don't think that mean God just means that God gives you whatever you want. I think it means that God gives you desires. And that he will then guide you through, the, through those desires. I get before God, I'm quiet, whatever you want, God. Suddenly, I have a desire. God gives us the desire so he can give us the desire. He guides us then through those impressions, through those desires that he puts in our heart. And, you know, I, I just think if, if you ask some simple questions at this point where you're yielding and you're just quiet and listening, just ask some simple questions like, Lord, is there anything in my life that you would like me to change? Be quiet and listen. You probably get an answer pretty quick. Probably have an impression pretty quick. Or Lord, what's the next step I need to take in my walk with you? What's the next step I need to take in our relationship? You know, the Lord might say, you just might have this funny impression. Read the book of Hosea. Spend more time praising me. Get up early in the morning and have some quiet time. I don't know what he might say, but I think God does have next steps for us to take. I think there are things that he wants us to change and shift, but we tend to never get there because we don't take the time to listen. It's important that we yield. Hello, friend. I hope that the, the broadcast today was a blessing to you, whether you watched on TV, YouTube, a podcast, or, or through some other means. We're just grateful that you've joined us. And listen, if, if today's message helped you, wouldn't you want to help someone else with it? I, I think we need to give away the blessings we have in our life. So I'd like you to consider being a partner with us. Help support what we do so we can bring the same blessing to other people people. Thank you for watching Answers with Bayless Conley. For more information and inspiration, visit AnswersBC.org.